Hello, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to AGRF and UQ's long read sequencing webinar supported by PAC5. My name's David Hawkes and I'm the Brisbane site manager um, at AGRF and I co-manage the PAC5 SQL 2 service with Angelica Christ from the IMB at the University of Queensland. It's a pleasure to be able to host and moderate today's webinar. The panel will the panel members um, will contribute to talks and will be answering some panel questions. And I'd just like to introduce you all to uh, the panelists we have here today. Um, we've got Dr. CX Chan, uh, who's a senior researcher from the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics at UQ School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences. Uh, he and his team use advanced computational and database approaches to study genome evolution of microbes, including bacteria, algae, and protists and develop highly scalable phylogenomic approaches. Uh, his research routinely involves de novo assembly and analysis of high throughput sequencing data. We also have here um, uh, Angelica Christ from the IMB sequencing facility. Angelica uh, has 15 years of commercial and research laboratory experience. She's worked in the field of next generation sequencing since uh, 2010 on various technology platforms and applications. Angelica manages the sequencing facility, as I mentioned before, um, and together we co-manage the PAC5 SQL2 platform. Uh, we're also very lucky today to have uh, a Keepin Chauf, um, who's a field bioinformatics scientist from PacBio. Uh, Keepin's postgraduate degree was in computational study of proteins. Uh, in his postdoctoral research, he integrated genomics and transcriptomics data to elucidate uh, insights into the evolution and resistant mechanisms of lung cancer. Keepin is currently working for PacBio um, and supporting cutting, cutting edge um, applications on, on the PacBio platform. Uh, lastly, we, we also have uh, Anna here. She's a business development officer from UQ. Anna represents the UQ based facilities, which have a range of services, including imaging, characterization, genomics, molecular engineering, recombinant protein capabilities, nanotech, and many more. Um, and lastly, for those of you who don't know me very well, my, um, I've uh, 14 years experience working within the genomic services at AGRF. Uh, I've been involved in a genome mass array, involved in Illumina High SQL 1000, Sanger sequencing, and most recently, Pack by SQL 2. Um, so today we've got a, a varied series of presentations um, to go through today. Um, uh, we're going to start with a talk from one of our, our clients, uh, Dr. Six Chan. Uh, Six is going to share his experiences working with PAC Biotechnologies in the study of dinoflagellate genomes. Um, following that talk, I'm going to give a, a very general talk about PAC BioSQL 2 applications from the perspective of someone running the platform. I'll cover what's possible in the platform, any relevant experiences I've had running it so far. It's going to be a top level summary. summary. Uh, however, stick around until the end and I'll provide some details on a grant that could fund your next PacBio research idea. Um, Angelica is going to follow with a quick talk on UQ um, sequencing facility. Um, uh, then we're going to go to Key Pin, uh, who's going to give a talk um, focusing on Hi-Fi read sequencing specifically. He's going to go into a lot more detail than I could ever on those applications. Um, and, and include some of the bioinformatic considerations. Um, lastly, we're going to have Anna Vokovic, who's going to talk about the UQ infrastructure and some of the capabilities. Uh, then we'll end this with a general panel discussion. Um, throughout all of the talks, I'd encourage you to type your questions into the chat window as you think of it. Um, we'll have some, have some time at the end of each talk to go through some of the questions. Uh, if we don't answer at the time, um, we can always pick it up at the end. Um, and if we get too many questions to get through all of them today, um, we'll endeavor to uh, send that email back to you um, to try and answer your question. Uh, so um, let's start with uh, CX's talk. Uh, this will be of particular interest uh, to many since CX has a lot of experience with PacBio data. Um, he's used the PacBio um, RS2, uh, the SQL, and now the SQL2 platform. Um, and it has lots of experience with high fire de novo assembly and ICC data sets. So I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it over to CX. Okay, uh, thanks David. Hello all, I am um, Chongxin Chan. 
better known as CX, and I am based at the Australian Center for Ecogenomics at the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Thanks very much to um, HRF and NG for giving me this opportunity to share some of our research uh, with you. In this presentation, I thought I would share with you our experience working with PacBio long read data in our research of the dinoflagellate genomes and why we think these genomes represent the final frontier of genomics. Dinoflagellates are a vastly diverse group of algae or phytoplankton. They range from critical symbionts in corals and other coral reef animals to bloom-forming toxin-producing species that cause red tide. Although dinoflagellates are ecologically important, little genome data are available for these algae. Why? Well, it's because the dinoflagellate genomes are highly idiosyncratic. They have enormous genome sizes, ranges between 1 to 250 gigabase, and that's more than 70 times larger than a human genome alone. The chromosomes are permanently condensed in liquid crystalline structure. The genomes are highly methylated, and the number of chromosomes remain unclear. However, two very recent um, studies published as bioarchive preprints in early July this year show that some species likely to have 91 to 94 chromosomes. Dinoflagellate genes are also strange. They have non-canonical intransplice sites and they have extensive RNA editing. Their organellar genomes are also strange. Now, all these features are against the backdrop of genetic transfer, gene duplication, and extensive repeat content. Our main interest thus far has been the Symbiodiniaceae dinoflagellates, shown as this golden cells um, within coral polyps on this slide. They are the most dominant symbionts in corals. Now, breakdown of this symbiosis due to environmental stress results in coral bleaching, and this puts the corals at risk of diseases, sorry, at risk of diseases and eventual death if this, this relationship is not as soon as re-established. Now, Symbiodiniaceae is a highly diverse family representing a broad range of ecological niches. They are largely symbiotic in diverse hosts, as shown in this slide here, and some have not been found to associate with any host. They are considered as free living. This table shows the list of dinoflagellate genome projects available. Those highlighted in yellow were generated by our team and are publicly available. The sequencing and analysis of three other genomes highlighted in orange there is ongoing. In total, we generated genome data from 12 isolates of Symbiodinia AC and three free living um, relatives down here, with genome sizes range between 0 0.7 gigabase and 6 gigabase. The free living genome, uh, the genomes of free living taxa are generally larger. Now, PegBio long read sequence data were generated for those species highlighted in red. So this two here, this one here, and the bottom three. Now, our generation of PegBio data first started with RS2, then SQL, and now SQL2. For the rest of my talk, I will focus on analysis of these data and how these data helped us in our research. We were the first to generate and publish PegBio long read data for any dinoflagellates. When we started our project to sequence the genomes of 10 coral symbionts about five years ago, the genome size estimates of these species are large. There are between three and five gigabase. So it is quite costly to generate this genome data using long read alone at the time. That's, for, that's why we generated both um, short reads, Illumina short reads and PicBio long reads in our attempt to achieve reasonable draft genome assemblies. As you can see here, we generated more than 200x for each of these genomes that we're interested in, incorporating both Illumina and PicBio long reads. We were also the first to generate and publish PicBio isoSeq transcriptome data for any dinoflagellates. 
In this case, with the help from um, Dr. Yuan Wen Cheng, who is now in University of Sydney, um, we used the Taylor Prime cDNA synthesis kit in this for this purpose instead of the um, the clone tech kit back in the days, um, because we believe Taylor Prime um, kit can recover um, full length transcripts better. Now, these transcriptome data are important for us for three reasons. First, there's little dinoflagellate data available in the public repositories. Second, these species are highly divergent, so there is not a one genome fits all reference. Three, dinoflagellate genes, as you know, are, have atypical features, so these full length transcripts will help us in guiding gene prediction from the genomes. The time consuming and the more challenging step for us is to develop a customized workflow for at initial gene prediction from dinoflagellate genomes. We, especially Tim, Raul, and Yibi shown here, spent a lot of time on this. And we ended up with an approach that integrates support evidence from transcriptome, including isoseq data, and protein sequences to yield a high confidence training set for gene prediction. And then we use a meta method approach, integrating prediction results from multiple methods to yield the final gene models. This process also involves a two phase strategy for removing um, putative contaminant sequences. Now, compared to the other published um, genomes derived um, from Illumina short read data, our hybrid uh, genome assemblies incorporating both Illumina and PECBIO data are more contiguous as shown by the lower number of scaffolds and higher number of N50 length um, as shown in this table. Now, some of you may think that an assembly with a few thousand scaffolds are bad. However, if in the case of dinoflagellates, this is actually good news. As you can see, most other assemblies contain tens of thousands of scaffolds. In fact, if you look at the larger genomes of the free, lab, uh, free living relative. PacBio data helped us in creating a more contiguous assembly that's shown here, the Masuka assembly here, highlighted in red here. But we still ended up with 30, close to 36 to 37,000 um, scaffolds, which is still a significant improvement from the greater than 90,000, closer to 100,000 scaffolds using Illumina short read only. Now, Repeat content is high in this genomes, greater than 65%. And in this instance, for two isolates of the same species, uh, what we call um, Polarella glacialis, we actually generated the first deployed genome assemblies from any dinoflagellates. Interestingly, one isolate, um, especially this Antarctic isolate, as you can see, the deployed genome size of three gigabase compared to 2.65 gigabase, in the Arctic isolate. This isolate on the left has about 360 megabase more than the other. And these are the same species. And these regions are largely repetitive and they do not impact um, genetic regions. So two isolates, one species, two very different genome sizes. When we compare the dinoflagellate genomes, we observe a clear trend of genes in these genomes that tend to be encoded in unidirectional clusters, as shown in this figure here, showing for um, the number of gene orientation change within a 10 gene windows. So what it means is we're looking at 10 genes at a time and count how many times does a gene orientation change. As you can see here, for dinoflagellates, both Polarella and Symbiotin, you see here, most of the genes appear in uh, unidirectional uni clusters. There's, there's very little changes. And this trend is not observed in the relatives of, other, of the dinoflagellates, as you see here, which are kind of uniform. Now, many, many genes are comprised of single exons, and many of these encode for critical functions. They are not bacterial contaminants because they are supported by packed by your iso full-length transcript data for which eukaryotic genes were selected. Now, many of these single exon genes, as shown in this figure here, occur in tandem repeats, just like this ice binding domain encoding genes shown on this slide. 
Now, ice mining domains are found in various co-adapted eukaryotes, and they are known to have a reason where horizontal gene transfer from a bacterial source. As you can see here, the iso transcript evidence here help us in making this, this, um, this, this uh, hypothesis that looking at this tandem repeated single exon genes, this is actually true biology in dinoflagellates and not due to some assembly artifacts. Now, overall, our, our results based on this analysis demonstrate how selection acts within the context of a complex genome structure to facilitate local adaptation. In the case of Polarella glacialis here, um, found only in the polar regions, the genomes appear to utilize a variety of strategies um, to enhance transcriptional response, including unidirectional coding, tandem duplication of single exome genes that encode functions that are critical for survival. Now, all these discoveries are enabled by packed by long read data. We are starting to see some of these characteristics in other dinoflagellate genomes as well. In fact, we believe that the use of long read data is a must for analysis of dinoflagellate genomes. We continue to generate long read data using PacBioSQL 2. And to further demonstrate how complicated dinoflagellates are, here is an example of how a clean DNA sample greatly enhances data yield. Now, this is a run we did uh, with the University of Washington um, using two smart cells on sequence. Two. Our first run yielded only, as you can see, close to 14 gigabase per cell, which is very little. And this is after our sample passed the QC. I call this the not so good run. Now, upon troubleshooting, as I show, I'll give you um, some email excerpts um, from, from the University of Washington people, um, we found that the dinoflagellate samples are indeed special. The facility attempted to further clean up our samples using MBPure bead washes and do another run on a single cell. And as you can see, in this second run, in only with one cell, we got 117 um, gigabase of unique molecular yield. So that's almost 10 times more data than we had in the not so good run. And data transfer is in progress as we speak, and we look forward to incorporate this data in our analysis. Now, even using these data from the first not so good run, our PhD student Sarah Shah managed to um, generate a de novo genome assembly with reasonable contiguity measures. And, and, and as, as shown in this paper here with about 10,000 scaffolds and 50 of 250K, and that is actually promising, right? In addition to find additional support for this genome data, Obviously, we also generated um, isoseq data using SQL2 here at UQ. Now, these are the first hi-fi data we generated. Tim Bruxner at UQ has been very helpful as we were trying to, uh, have been, uh, as we're trying to make sense of this data. And he assisted us in running through the isoseq3 workflow as shown here. Generally, in the framework of smart version 8, the subreads were first used to generate consensus circular sequences, the CCS, which were then refined into a full length non concatenable FLNC reads. Further clustering would then yield what we call the high quality transcripts or HQ transcripts. And these HQ transcripts can be subjected to further polishing to yield the um, final transcripts. Right? So, first from subreads to CCS, then to FLNC, and then to HQ and then to the final. Now, this is how the data look like uh, for two different um, um, species that I'll show on this slide. Um, generally, the number of sequences were further reduced at each of these steps. And the HQ transcripts, as shown here, are shorter with higher GC. And the GC for the HQ transcripts approximate to what we observed in the RNA-seq data, um, as shown here. So um, this is what we are seeing. And in, in fact, in one genome, um, the, the transcripts are longer than the other. So here we have about 3,000 base pair, and here we have about you know, 1,600 base pair. Um, but we still don't know what that means. Um, more interestingly, we observed uh, a high proportion of these transcripts mapped against the draft genome assemblies we have. 
for instance, about 99% of the HQ transcripts mapped against the long read only assembly that was generated from the not so good run I described earlier. Now, we then ran into a different problem. Parser is a program commonly um, used to align transcripts against assembled genome sequences to assess potential genes encoded in the genome. We use this program in our workflow too. But as you can see in the numbers highlighted in red on this slide, the percentage of isoseq transcripts that passed the alignment and validation step in Parser is much lower compared to our independent mapping analysis shown here, right? based on Minimap2 and, and Black here. Upon closer inspection, these um, failed alignments are largely in contiguous alignments due to poorly resolved intron exon junctions. These leads us to believe that this excavation is due to alternative splice sites and RNA editing in dinoflagellates. The choice of mapping tools obviously affects the results. And here for isoseq data, Minimap2 is our program of choice. Now, in our an earlier analysis, we found that the clustering step in the ISO 6.3 workflow, um, which is here, the clustering step from FLNC to HQ, um, may reduce the discovery of RNA-edited sites. Therefore, the use of HQ transcripts or the final transcripts it may not be appropriate for this purpose. So we are currently do, redoing some of this analysis using Smart Version 9 to generate CCS with polishing included to generate high quality FLNC reads for analysis of RNA editing. Now for the purpose of getting ISOC transcripts to guide gene prediction, we will still use the final transcripts. And we would use Minimap2 for mapping the transcripts against the genome and incorporate these results into PASA to improve um, the rate uh, of transcripts that pass the alignment validation. Hopefully I have convinced you today that the genomes of dinoflagellates are weird and fascinating at the same time. The more we study these genomes, the more we find new things to explore. Now, PEG bio long read technology can help in resolving some parts of these genomes, especially repetitive elements, RNA editing, and, and transplicing of splice leader sequences, which I didn't have time to talk about today. But you know, this could be a fun challenge. It is challenging, but the, the challenge has been fun for us. The recent achievement of chromosome level genome assembly on one of these species um, using high C um, is not easy. Um, it took them about 10 years. And I'm excited to see how the research in this space progresses. Now, from the biological perspective, the genome data we generated from Symbi DNA C produced, uh, provide a, a foundation for studying dinoflagellate genomics and genome scale analysis will allow us to address more fundamental questions related to genome evolution and the resilience of this ecologically important species. Now, this is our team at the Australian Center for Ecogenomics, or ACE, at UQ. Um, they are the ones who did the, all the hard work. Tim and Raul, who started the PEC bio journey with dinoflagellates, are now postdocs in the US. And um, before I stop, I would like to thank all our collaborators and funding agencies without which our research would not be possible. We are currently working with our collaborators in the University of Technology Sydney, University of Melbourne, and in Germany on a bunch of other dinoflagellar genomes. And I'm happy to answer any questions and we welcome any ideas and suggestions of how we can further tackle these genomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, CX. That was fantastic. Um, do we have any questions coming through um, in the chat? If you got a question from CX's talk, please um, please type it in the chat and we'll 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 ask. Um, CX, I, I have a, a quick question for you. Just something I noted, and maybe you can explain just a little bit. Um, with your isoseq data. Um, you, you mentioned that as you were going through the analysis, you decided to use polishing uh, using subread data. How much of an improvement does that, that grant you? 
Uh, I, I, I can't really give you a number on top it, of It's a computationally intensive step to, to add. Um, so I'm sort of, is it something that you recommend to do now in the workflows for ISOSEQ? Um, I think it's really depending on the, the species you're looking at. Um, the problem with dinoflagellates in this case is that they have a lot of RNA editing going on. So we don't want to, we, and we would like to um, look at what are the RNA edited sites. So in order to do that, um, we decided to focus on the FINC instead of the clustered reads, because when you cluster the reads together, then we may be missing some of the RNA edited site just simply based on consensus. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, I just have a quick question. Uh, CX, that's a great talk. Uh, I'm just curious about your PASA filtering. Because um, you lost uh, quite a significant proportion of transcripts because of that. Um, are you sure that uh, has to do with RNA editing or could it be related to something like your species may not have canonical things like um, intron splice, uh, donor acceptor size or that kind of things? Because I think PASA might filter based on um, that kind of um, intron boundaries. Right. Uh, thanks, Raymond. Hi. Um, so uh, we we actually looked at so so one of the students, E. B. He spent a lot of time looking at the alignments of of, of PASA alignments um, in all these um, weird, incontiguous cases that fail, and we do see instances where the alignment fail mainly because of one or two bases um, near the end of the internal exon um, junction that wouldn't match. And so, so in cases, we, we actually see in cases of truncated exons or, or a, total, a short exon totally being missed out um, by, this, um, by, by the alignment tool that, that PASA uses, which is BLAS or um, what is the other one? I can't remember now. Um, yeah, so, so, so and, and we found that Minimap 2 actually um, uh, can map isoseq data better um, mm -hmm. on the genome. So, so we're, we're going to incorporate that into PASA instead. Okay, thanks. Um, I've just got another question coming from Scott Dietzen. He asks, um, were there any disadvantages that you saw for using hi-fi reads over um, the standard CLR longer reads? Um, well, I think hi-fi reads are more accurate and that's a, that's a significant advantage. Um, so, so we did both. We, we, both, we have data for both CLRs and, and hi-fi. And um, I haven't, we haven't done enough an analysis just yet to see what difference does it make. So I can't really answer the question properly because um, we, we really just got getting the hi-fi data um, very recently. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can add to that is that um, when you are using hi-fi reads, you're getting less reads off your smart cell, um, but uh, they are much more accurate. So it's, it's this play of the two. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question coming in from Oliver Berkowitz and he's asking around the polishing of the read data, how much um, more computing power does this need? RAM core set, can this be done on a standard HPC? Um, I, I, I'll try and answer that. I'm not really an expert. Maybe uh, Key Pin, if he's available, might be able to answer that better than I could. Um, it's, it's, I'm sure it can be done on a standard HPC. Um, it, it's just uh, because it's coming off the subread data and not the CCS data, um, those subread files are a lot larger, and so you're just going to chew a little bit, little bit more processing power to do it. Um, and it's uh, at one stage it wasn't a recommended option, um, but it, it it probably I think depends on on your species whether it's something you should be doing or not. Um, uh, at uh, Adref and UQ, um, we've access to a a sizable, but not not um, insane sort of uh, compute power, and it it's fine to to run it on that. Okay, so um, uh, my talk is, uh, as I said, it's a much more general talk. Um, it's it's uh, just coming from someone who's running these projects. Um, and it's sort of to give you an idea about um, sort of my, the perspective of uh, a, a brief summary of each of the applications and some uh, notes that I've sort of noted while, while running them. Um, okay. 
So, Adrif um, partnered with UQ um, to set up uh, PackBio SQL2 um, sequencing service uh, using uh, uh, the instrument was placed um, in late February this year. Uh, we've undergone quite a bit of training from PackBio. Um, we've met the requirements um, to be included in the PackBio certified service provider program. Um, and since then, we've been busy uh, running some projects, um, developing some experience on the platform. Um, and so far, the feedback we've had has been fairly positive. And I feel like um, this is largely driven by two primary properties that the new platform uh, has. Um, firstly, um, it's just got more data output. So over the SQL, you're getting eight times more data. Um, the uh, smart cells have uh, 8 million ZMW wells, um, and it just enables for bigger, more cost-effective projects. Um, I, I'm starting to get the feeling that, that the increase in data is opening up the platform a lot more uh, to allow more applications on it. Um, and uh, I think it, it's sort of really sort of pushing this area forward greatly. Um, and, and naturally, you're, you're coming with uh, reduced costs, um, faster completion times for projects. Um, you've got a lot of the uh, really good properties that you're seeing on the SQL 2. You have very long reads, high consensus accuracy, minimal sequence context bias, um, and of course, the, the hi-fi reads. Uh, and I'll, I'll just touch on these, because this, I think, is the other um, really um, big um, uh, improvement or, or um, property that's really driving projects at the moment. Um, and it, it's basically um, the ability to, um, instead of just focus on sequencing the longest read you can, um, you're going around your smart bell that you formed and sequencing it again and again uh, to increase accuracy. So while you're sacrificing some of the size, the improvements in accuracy uh, can be quite striking. Um, we're still looking at read lengths or fragment sizes of around 15 to 20 KB in size. Um, the, um, uh, the sub-read data you're getting off is fairly sizable that you get, but the consensus um, CCS read um, is a much smaller amount of data, much more focused, information dense. Um, and you're getting accuracies that are sort of approaching uh, Illumina read accuracies. Um, and I think that that's a real, real game changer. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about what you can do on the platform, just a few um, topics on that. Uh, Whole genome sequencing is an area which really benefits from the strengths of the SQL 2. Um, we're seeing a lot of projects in this area. Um, you can get very high quality genome assemblies, uh, no reference required. Uh, in many cases, the long read data doesn't need to be paired with short read data anymore. Um, and it's just because of a combination of an increased output and the accuracy of the hi-fi reads um, is allowing projects to be assembled with just pack bio data. Um, assembly is simpler, um, just using the large fragments, fragments, and the coverage tends to be more even. Um, at the moment, you can sequence up to a two gigabase genome per smart cell. Um, you do need a fair amount of DNA going to this. Um, this can be issue in, an issue in some cases. Uh, you really do want to achieve very high molecular weight DNA. Uh, looking at uh, greater than 40 KB fragment sizes um, is ideal. Um, the, the larger, the, the more intact, intact, the better. So this makes extraction an area that really needs to be considered um, before starting a project. Um, you really want to start thinking about how you're going to get the highest quality GDNA possible to go into that. Um, and you can, of course, talk to us or go to the pack buyer for recommendations in this area. Um, of particular note, we've had good experiences so far with the nanobind kits from Circulomics. Uh, they're not applicable to all extraction types, but they are a great place to start. Um, because we're dealing with very high molecular weight DNA, QC is also an area which really you need to consider. Um, high molecular weight DNA to the size terribly well on standard gels. Uh, the standard pulse field solutions can take several hours. Uh, and we've had a lot of success so far using femtopulse QC for high molecular weight um, DNA QC. It's very quick, it takes about an hour, hour-ish, Per run. It's very accurate by comparison. Um, Femto Pulse machines are quite expensive. Uh, we're helped here um, by the car facility at QT, which provides an excellent service for Femto Pulse runs for us. Um, 
when you're looking at coverage, um, uh, the target is uh, about 15 fold coverage. Um, uh, increasing coverage beyond this um, shows decreasing benefits. Um, coming off the machine, what we're starting to see is uh, CCS reads in the order of about 1.5 to 2 million reads um, fragment, with fragment sizes of 15 to 20 kb. Um, the number of polymerase, polymerase reads is much higher, um, um, which is what you would get from just CLR kind of focused reads. Um, but the conversion to CCS reads drops this down a little bit. Um, and as, as I alluded to before, the amount of data coming off the machine in suburb form is you're getting very large files. You could be looking at um, hundreds of gigabytes, gigabytes per smart cell. Um, however, after conversion to CCS reads, the amount of data drops significantly. You might be looking at like 20 to 30 gigabytes files per smart cell. Um, this is application specific and we're seeing some variation around these figures. Um, and another thing I'll just note uh, is the speed of assembly of CCS data uh, can be very quick. Uh, I just recently heard that we've got some clients assembling uh, four to gig, three to four gigabase genomes um, in hours. Uh, obviously, uh, this depends greatly on your compute resources you have available, uh, but even more modest um, resources can be assembled in, in days. Uh, it's quite impressive. I, I think um, PacBio have got a demonstration a project on the the Redwood genome, which is like a 27 gigabase genome, which they assembled in around six days. So really impressive things can be achieved here. Um, I'll just touch on uh, the, another topic, another area you can look at, uh, microbial de novo assembly. This is an area where PECBio has been used successfully for quite some time now. Um, this method does use uh, the CLR mode, that's the long reads, uh, where the reads are longer, but the accuracy is lower. Um, the pipelines are well established here and they work very well to produce closed circular genomes. Um, while the accuracy is lower on the reads, the, the genomes themselves are reference standard in most cases, uh, with all the errors being um, random and cancel each other out. Um, and the major improvement here on the SQL 2 is, is again, just the, the amount of data that you're getting off the machine. Um, you can look at uh, 32 to 48 samples per smart cell. Um, in uh, the CLR mode, you're looking for a coverage target of around 50x. Um, and uh, the, the amount of DNA you need for it is not too great in this case, about around a mi one microgram per sample. Um, PacBio, long reads, obviously uh, perfect for looking at structural variations. Um, uh, you can look at this in actually two modes. Uh, in CLR mode, um, you're, look you're looking at creating very large insert libraries much greater than 20 kb, you probably get fragments up to about 70 kb. Um, this does put a lot of pressure on an extremely good quality DNA, gDNA as input source, more so than even high fire reads because you really need those very intact fragments. Um, in this mode, you can uh, look at two samples per three gigabase genome. Um, and it's, it's putting this up against uh, some like short read technology, you're gonna find a lot more structural variants uh, using this approach. Um, uh, up to five times more, um, in fact. Uh, uh, if you're looking at variant detection uh, using CCS reads, um, you can actually get some really amazing results. Um, it, it's actually quite impressive what it can do in, in the area for small variants um, for, a, for a long read technology. Uh, and this is due to the high accuracy, again, from the CCS reads. Um, CCS reads uh, should be able to deliver, a, you know, Q20 scores, but you can see average Q Q30 or even Q40 scores um, in these CCS reads. Um, there's a sort of recent um, a truth challenge performed. Um, I think uh, Key Pin might talk a little bit more about this. Um, um, but in that study, basically, um, there was uh, 64 labs submitting uh, to um, submit to uh, the truth set using Illumina, Oxford Nanopore, or PacBio data sets. Uh, and 25 of the top 26 most accurate core sets use PacBio data either alone or mixed with another technology. Um, now, this is really focused on difficult regions of the genome to sequence. Um, so it does say something about PacBio's ability to sequence in those regions. Um, but uh, a particular interest, um, a submission using uh, Google Deep Variant as the caller uh, and HIFO reads 
achieves the highest genome-wide accuracy on any single technology um, and better performance than the, um, the popular combination of GATK with the Luma short reads. Um, truly amazing. Uh, and I um, hope you can keep in, uh, go through that a little bit more detail. Um, it's very, it can be very accurate. Um, Illumina reads still have a, a good advantage on cost, but if you're looking at SNPs um, in difficult sequence regions of the genome, or uh, if you're also looking at structural variants at the same time, impact by variant detection is a very attractive approach. All right, I'll just touch on ISOSeq. So ISOSeq is an application that offers, um, I guess in a way, companion data to your typical RNA-seq data. Um, what it lacks the higher read count you get from a lumen, a lumen short reads that sort of enables it to be quantitative down to rare transcripts. Um, your ISOSeq provides full cDNA sequence reads without any assembly required. And this can give you information on mRNA isoforms that you can't necessarily get from short read data. Uh, makes it an excellent platform for whole genome annotation. Uh, it can be a good companion to de novo genome assembly projects. Um, and downstream RNA-seq projects. Um, it is possible to look at RNA transcripts in a more targeted fashion using capture approaches or Amplicon workflows. Um, and in this case, you can use it for detecting gene fusions or uh, SNPs for allele-specific gene expression. Um, and in, this, in, in a more targeted mode, it's possible to, to actually um, use the data more quantitatively. Um, the input for this workflow is, is fairly low at 300 nanograms of cDNA. You can barcode up to 12 samples. Um, so far, we're not seeing many people use the, the full barcoding capacity of 12 samples. Um, most people are looking at uh, one or two samples per smart cell. Um, the standard method we're using is focused more on eukaryotic gen genomes, but it is possible to look at bacterial transcriptomes um, with the right method. Um, uh, ISOSeq tends to get a little bit more data um, than we get from uh, CCS data on de novo assembly projects. Uh, I think it's because the average insert sizes tend to be a lot smaller here. Um, and we're seeing um, a, a range of read sizes and some of the, the, the better performing ones are coming up to uh, 3 million reads CCS or, or higher. Um, that's really quite impressive. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about some uh, targeted approaches. Um, uh, it has, uh, because you're getting these long reads, you can start looking at things um, uh, to sort of utilize that sort of long reads. Um, one of them is, you know, 16S sequencing. You can cover the entire 16S gene in one, one go. So that's obviously an attractive option there. You can um, get a lot more resolution out of your 16S data. Um, because you've got long reads, you're able to phase your SNPs um, and phasing SNPs um, is particularly useful for, for some applications. Um, a topical one at the moment, um, SARS-CoV-2, um, where you can uh, really look at subspecies um, uh, at great detail. Um, the, the longer amplicons, uh, require, you require a lot less amplicons to cover the entire genome. Um, so it's a it's a it's another really interesting application on the pack bio. Um, lastly, I'll just touch a little bit on NOAMP sequencing. Um, this is a really good application um, when uh, it's commonly used for repeat expansion variants. It allows you to to target on the genome uh, and uh, avoid PCR biases or or issues that you get with PCR. Um, PCR for repeat expansions um, can uh, are susceptible to errors, amplification bias. Um, so NOAP can be useful in, in some applications. Um, it could also potentially be used um, when you're looking at a base modification. Um, I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Um, all right, yeah. So, so lastly, I will just focus on uh, base modification. Uh, often you're getting base modification information kind of for free along with your sequencing. The information is encoded in the timing between each base edition. Um, the, I will say though that the, the, the coverage that you need to detect different types of base modifications does vary. Um, 
Bases like 6-methyl adenine, 8-oxoguanine, 4-methylcysteine can be detected with fairly low coverage, um, around about 25x. 5-methylcytosine um, and hydroxymethylcytosine do require a lot more coverage um, uh, to the point where it, it's uh, hard to recommend that as an option. Um, Keeping might be able to provide a little bit more information about that. Um, I, I do believe you can improve the, the coverage requirements through um, uh, glycosylation of hydroxymethylcytosine to drop that down. Mostly we're seeing interest in, in this area in bacteria where 6-methyladenine has a biological function. Um, we do have a project coming up soon to have a look at this, so I'm very keen to see how that goes. Anyway, um, those are just a brief outline of the applications. It's not actually all the applications you can run on the PAC BioSQL 2. Um, I'll just quickly um, put up a slide about our account managers, which are spread evenly across Australia. Um, so there'll be there's someone local you can talk to about um, PAC Bio projects um, if you're working with us. Um, I'll also just include a slide of uh, the operations team involved in doing um, projects on this platform. Um, uh, cool. uh, and lastly, I'll just uh, I'll put this slide up. This is the Smart Grant Program. Very excited to, to sort of talk about this briefly. Um, basically, this is a grant performed um, with AGRF and UQ um, with a lot of support from PacBio. Um, PacBio have kindly provided the reagents and um, we'll be providing um, the actual sequencing. Um, so what do you get? You're getting library construction of up to two samples, um, pack bio sequencing of four 8M smart cells uh, and some preliminary bioinformatics analysis. So if you're interested in this, um, all you need to do is submit a 300 or less word proposal detailing how HiFi reads will accelerate your science. Um, there's a bit of time on this. Uh, entries close the 12th of October. Uh, 2012. Um, hopefully there's, there'll be a link coming up in the chat so you don't need to write down the, uh, the link on the screen. Um, all right. All right, and, and I guess just to close, um, if you have any questions about the services, um, if you'd like to get in contact with us, uh, please use the email address um, on, this, on the slide. All right. Um, thank you all. Um, now, what I'll do now is I will um, pass to um, Angelica to give you a brief um, uh, talk about uh, UQ services. Thank you very much, David. Hello, my name is um, Angie Christ and I'm the IMB Sequencing Facility Manager. And as David just mentioned, we are part of the HRF UQ Pack Bio Service. And the SQL tool is located in the Institute for Molecular Biosciences here at UQ. I won't go into detail about the um, about the Pack Bio sequencing service, HRF UQ Pack Bio Sequencing Search, but I would just like to flag, really sorry, my um, slide. Doesn't seem to go any further. Here we go. Sorry. Um, so I would like to um, just want to flag that besides a long read sequencing service, we are also here to help you with your short read sequencing projects. In terms of library preparation, apart from the pack bio libraries for long read sequencing, we can also prepare your short read. Illumina DNA and RNA libraries in particular, I want to highlight our RNA and single cell expertise for most single cell projects. We are using the 10X chromium um, system, but also have experience with other library preparation kits, starting with as little as 38 cells, if that's of interest. Independent to the library preparation and sequencing service we provide, we can also offer to quality check your RNA and DNA samples via various QC methods. And you've seen it a couple of times now, but here's our newest machine, very exciting, the so PacBio SQL tool. And there's also a picture of the NextSeq, the Illumina NextSeq 500 we have here in our lab. So um, 
please feel free if you have any questions um, about a project or would like to discuss anything. These are our email addresses. This is my team here, and then obviously the PacBio minus UQ at hrforg.io. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, very excited to announce uh, to, to, to announce Key Pin uh, to give a talk on Hi-Fi applications. Um, as I mentioned before, keeping comes from PacBio directly. Um, and so I'll just hand over to him. I'm very excited to hear his talk. Thank you, David. Um, let me just share my screen. All right. Um, yeah, hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kipin. So um, I'll actually um, talk to you about um, pack bio sequencing um, and the applications of it with um, the SQL2 system. Um, essentially, I want to introduce to you um, our latest uh, sequencing using um, the so-called hi-fi reads, which is long and accurate and what you can do with it. Um, and the agenda today is that our first focus is on um, what exactly is hi-fi sequencing and um, the characteristics of hi-fi data. And I'll actually go into um, a lot more details on hi-fi for genome assembly, reasons being that um, you will actually see a, a lot of the advantages of hi-fi data through genome assembly and how you can actually apply the same advantages to all the other applications that you are actually thinking. Um, I'll finally go into um, all the other applications that you can actually do with um, Packed by hi fi data. So, um, firstly, what is actually hi fi sequencing? Um, I'll first go, in, go into a, a, a little bit of background on, you know, kind of like a throughput evolution of Packed Bio, starting from um, the first instrument, which is RS, to um, all the way to um, our latest SQL2 system and using the latest 2.0 chemistry and the uh, um, the latest version of software, um, we have actually achieved more than 10,000 fold in terms of the throughput increase and more than 100 fold in the read length increase. And this is really what um, enables um, us to actually um, achieve the latest um, hi fi reads technology in terms of achieving more than Q50 consensus accuracy. So this is 99.999% um, accurate and um, our reads can achieve tens of kilobases. Now, even in the hi-fi mode, we can actually go up to um, 25 KB. Um, and what's really exciting is that all these are achieved in terms of single molecule resolution. So um, um, tra traditionally, if you want to achieve high accuracy with long reads, um, it usually requires a multi-molecule con consensus, meaning you actually um, overlap the sequences um, from different DNA molecules to actually achieve kind of like the accuracy. Um, but with high fi reads, this is simply, a, you know, kind of like a single molecule resolution and I'll go into more details later as well. Um, most of the protocols do not require DNA amplification. So you do get uniform coverage across um, um, the different GC contents and this will actually um, avoid kind of like a sequence complexity bias. Um, and as they, Dave has um, actually introduced just now that, you know, you kind of get epigenetic detection for free. So um, now the kind of like what is exciting today is really what we um, want to introduce to you is that the old paradigm is that DNA sequence are either um, long or accurate. So the conventional, um, for example, Illumina sequencing uh, allows you to achieve very highly accurate reads. Um, even though they are very um, short. And uh, conventional long reads technology uh, allows you to achieve very high read length um, at the uh, expense of um, its accuracy. So what we have now is so-called hi-fi reads, which is both um, long and, and actually accurate. So uh, this is really uh, allowing a, a lot, a whole new paradigm where um, in terms of all the different applications that you 
traditionally used in um, genomic sequencing, you can actually now do it um, without any compromise in terms of um, accuracy as well as the read length. So why do you want to actually um, do pack bio high five sequencing? And these are really what I um, have mentioned just now as well. They are actually very long. So you don't have to sacrifice a lot of um, read lengths if you want it to be very accurate. So with our latest library preps protocol, um, you can achieve up to actually 25 kilobase in the insert size. And they are very accurate. So um, we define high five reads as the reads that actually have uh, more than um, Q20, which is 99% accuracy. Um, um, however, most of the time they're actually uh, more accurate than this. Um, in fact, with a 15 KB insert size, we routinely see um, a, a very average accuracy of about Q30, which is 99.9%. So, um, and these high fi reads are single molecule. So every read come, um, every high fi read actually comes from the same DNA fragment. So this is allowed by um, the single molecule um, real-time sequencing technology through the zero mode waveguide for our from pack bio system. So um, they have little bias. There is no DNA amplification involved, um, at least for the standard protocol. Um, there is no GC content bias and um, sequence complexity bias is low as well. Um, and shown here is really an example of um, how accurate uh, HiFi reads. And you can see that what, we, what is shown on screen here is actually a, a almost 20 KB long um, HiFi read. And the predicted QB value is about 30 Q33. So this means that there is actually only eight errors in the entire 20 KB um, read. So this is um, really very, um, exciting for us and, and you know for everyone who's doing um, genomic technology because there's just simply nothing that looks like this um, across the genomic um, sequencing landscape. So and um, one of the concerns that is often raised up is that how expensive are hi-fi reads um, and I would say you know with the latest sequel to system they are actually um, getting very affordable so many applications can now be completed with a single smart cell 8m so for whole genome sequencing, as David has mentioned just now, you can assemble up to a um, two gigabase genome with one smart cell. Um, and RNA sequencing it as well, with a single smart cell AM, you can get a very good characterization of the transcriptomics landscape. Um, targeted sequencing and complex population, in fact, you can actually multiplex um, uh, many samples in a single smart cell. So the read length is routinely about 15 to 25 kilobase. And with uh, one smart cell 8M, you are able to achieve um, 20 to 30 gigabase of um, um, yield. So um, shown here is uh, again an example of um, two hi-fi libraries prepared for a human um, DNA. So on the left is a 15 KB insert size. On the right is actually a 20 KB insert size. And um, you can see that we, uh, the, what's in bold is the number of Q20 bases, which is essentially the amount of hi-fi bases generated. So for the 15 KB metric, um, this is an example of a one single smart cell AM library where we managed to achieve 27 gigabase, um, which is about nine-fold coverage of a, a human genome in a single smart cell. And even if you go up to 20 KB metric, so you see, you can see that the number of reads are actually smaller because the insert size are bigger, but the number of bases are actually um, very similar because each of the reads is actually now a lot longer. And you, um, you can still achieve a very high accuracy despite the higher read length. So at 20 KB, you are actually really only sacrificing about 0.04% of accuracy in this example here. And um, I will now go into uh, uh, kind of like a details for hi-fi sequencing for genome assembly. And as I mentioned just now, this is really um, one of the major application of um, hi-fi sequencing and you know what all the advantages that I'm going to talk about for high genome assembly um, are actually you know important for all the other applications as well. Um, so this is really an easier way for me to demonstrate why hi-fi sequencing is so important. So um, when you look at de novo assembly of genome, um, really there are four aspects that you want to look at. Um, uh, traditionally, you know, it's really contiguity, completeness, and correctness. So the so-called 3C. With HiFi um, sequencing, 
um, we think that compute is now one of the major advantage um, for us. So we are really looking at four C's, you know, starting from compute, um, into contiguity of the genome assembly, into the completeness of the gene space, and um, finally, how correct is the assembly? Okay, so um, in terms of the HiFi assembly workflow, so um, on the left, you can see that generally the workflow goes with um, using CCS to generate HiFi reads. So regardless of what applications you are using, you will actually um, generate the HiFi reads with this algorithm called circular consensus sequencing. So you can do this in our software, Smart Link. And on the right, you can see that CCS has actually been um, getting a lot of algorithmic um, improvements starting from Smart Link 6 all the way to Smart Link 9. There is actually a, a, um, a constant increase in speed. And with a single smart cell library, um, this actually takes about six hours to complete, which is um, very fast. And second step of the genome assembly typically involves um, um, correction of long reads. So because we don't actually need to do that, um, that has already been done with the CCS, we can proceed directly to read to read overlapping. So you overlap the reads to actually construct the relationship between the different sequences um, generated in the HiFi reads. And this is again one of the major advantage that um, HiFi allows because um, of the accuracy, you can actually use very stringent um, overlapping criteria. So that allows for a more accurate assembly. And then finally constructing the graph layout with the overlap um, and then extract the context. So, um, and, you know, um, and comparing to this HiFi um, reads to a traditional long reads, this is really what we want to emphasize in terms of compute time and, and as well as the storage usage. So uh, this is an example of a human genome assembly using Falcon, so which is our um, uh, assembler that is, has traditionally been used in long reads, but you can actually use it with HiFi reads as well. So using the same infrastructure for the same um, genome. And um, with HiFi reads, you only need about 24 coverage, whereas with long reads, traditionally, you want um, about 64 coverage, for example. Um, and um, comparing the assembly process, you can see that you know, um, with HiFi reads, you are achieving almost a twofold um, decrease in terms of uh, uh, CPU time. And the most striking difference here is actually in terms of this usage, where um, you know, we managed to achieve about 15-fold decrease in uh, the this usage for a single HiFi genome. So this is really um, potentially a, a huge saving for you um, if you are trying to um, get a high-performance computing um, cluster to uh, uh, carry out your HiFi experiments. So, and what's, what I talked about just now is actually with the Falcon assembler, but we actually have a new assembler called um, IPA, Improved Phase Assembly. And comparing to Falcon, you can see that um, it's IPA actually uh, achieves almost um, ninefold faster in terms of the compute time. And it, it with a similar um, performance in terms of contiguity as well as the base QV and um, also um, phase accuracy. So, um, you know, one of the advantage with uh, HiFi reads as well is that you can actually achieve a very good um, deploy assembly, um, therefore obtaining a very good um, haplotype, uh, so-called alternate haplotype for your assembly. So, um, IPA is really um, is still being constantly improved, but, you know, in, even in the very preliminary results that we are seeing, it is um, a lot faster uh, with a very similar uh, results comparing to a traditional Falcon assemble, assembly. And um, we also have this um, real world project that they briefly talked about just now where um, you know, um, our team uses HiFi ASM, which is um, a, a third party assembly tools to actually assemble, assemble a California real world, which is 27 gigabase in genome length in just six days. So uh, this is really kind of like amazing if you compare to um, some other assembly that has been done, you know, um, with ONT that took actually about five to six months. Um, um, yeah, so this is really what is possible now with a HiFi and this is really important because imagine now you can actually um, tune around the parameters for your assembly, it, you know, for, for you to actually optimize it. Um, whereas traditionally that is 
very painful to do because every time you change a parameter, that's going to take very long time to uh, rerun the assembly. Um, in terms of the coverage requirement, so um, shown here on the shown here on the plot is um, the different amount of smart cell for human genome. So one smart cell, you generally, uh, it's the first point, and then with two smart cell, you get to the second point, and then three smart cell, third point, and then four smart cell on the fourth point. So um, we can see that, you know, uh, really starting from about two smart cells, um, the contiguity improvement is um, still going up, um, but even with just two smart cells, you can actually achieve very good uh, assembly. And um, because of this, we now recommend you to actually um, about 10 to 15 full coverage for each haplotype. So for human, that would um, means that if you want a very good um, assembly in terms of both um, separating the haplotypes as well as, as getting a very good primary assembly, so that would mean you need um, at least 24 um, and um, ideally about 34 coverage. So, and, and you know, this is the blue line is really with our, our conventional, um, um, this blue line is done with IP assembler, but if you go with other assembly tools such as High Canoe, which in a recent preprint, they have shown a N50 of about 47 MB. And I also want to bring to your attention to the latest tool, which is HiFi ASM by um, Hao Yu Cheng um, and um, Hang Li. So this, in this paper, um, you know, the latest NG50 is actually um, um, over 90 megabytes long, which is um, very amazing. It means that you already get a chromosomal level assembly with just HiFi technology. In terms of completeness, so um, with what is the advantage of HiFi here is that in uh, human, for example, you, we observe that you know while the Busco complete score, um, which describes how many genes are actually being um, sequenced, it's very similar. But when you look at the species specific in frame genes um, that does not have kind of like uh, indel errors or um, um, frame shift errors, with a high fire risk, you, you can actually achieve a much better um, completeness in terms of species specific in frame. And in rice, we didn't, we didn't exactly see the same thing, but because you know, even with long reads, that has already achieved a very high um, gene uh, completeness. So this is actually really uh, allowed because um, HiFi reads actually uses a single molecule consensus. So there is no um, error correction using uh, um, sequences from other molecules. So why is this important is that if you look at um, the comparison here where on top is actually a kind of like a conventional um, overlapping of a long read, whereas on the bottom is really the hi-fi read. So what happens is that if you have repeat regions that are very similar to each other, you actually risk um, taking reads from um, uh, regions that is very similar and then correcting each other. So this will actually cause um, a lot of um, um, artificial SNPs that are, that's actually not there, but it's really um, because of the multi-molecule um, consensus. Whereas with HiFi reads, you don't actually have this kind of issue because every read is corrected within itself. So um, allowing you to actually separate um, the repeat regions, even, th even though they only have maybe, you know, just a few um, SNPs differences. So in terms of correctness, so um, this is from um, some of the literature that has been published in um, BioArchive. And you can see that generally, if you assem assemble um, uh, um, HiFi reads, so, so the, the results shown here actually um, without um, polishing. So even without polishing, you can achieve um, uh, almost Q50 accuracy. And the accuracy here is measured based on the comparison to short reads. So there is no polishing involved. Um, but we use short reads to gauge roughly how accurate is the HiFi um, with this tool called Mercury. So it's by Arangri. And, um, you know, really with just HiFi reads, you're you are getting about Q50. So this gets rid of the conventional um, procedure where you usually need short reads to actually correct them. So to summarize them, um, you know, HiFi assemblies um, is faster, more contiguous, is more complete, and it is highly accurate. So, um, you know, I also want to bring to your attention that there is now uh, an upcoming ultra low input protocol that allows you to actually sequence very uh, minimal amount of DNA with uh, uh, amplification protocol. So 
And what we have seen so far is that despite using amplifications um, um, in our collaboration with customers in the beta testing of the protocol, you can actually achieve very highly um, contiguous um, uh, genome assembly and um, achieve a very high Busco complete score. So this means that, you know, even though we expect there is some bias in terms of amplification, um, uh, it actually still gives you a very um, complete look at genome. And this would actually enable um, the Nova assembly of many, many more organisms. So we are all very excited with these um, upcoming applications. And um, I'll just go through with you, you know, some of the other applications that you can um, achieve with HiFi reads. So um, Dave has already mentioned this just now. Essentially, you can use HiFi reads to call variants and allowing you to actually get a very comprehensive look at the um, single nucleotide variation in DELS as well as structural variants. And um, in the latest precision FDA truth challenge, we can see that um, using the deep variants and pack bio. Um, you achieve a very, um, uh, basically the best performance of any single technology possible um, using PacBio Hi-Fi technology. So, um, and, and you know, deep variant is really the variant color that's provided by Google um, and, and um, it's highly optimized and it's actually very fast as well. And comparing to, you know, the conventional book, so Illumina with um, deep variant and Manta, um, I think, um, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, with um, PacBio HiFi reads, you are getting the best um, comparing to all the other technologies. So, um, and one of the highlights uh, that we want to actually talk to you about is the metagenomic approaches with using HiFi reads. So why is this um, uh, another exciting application is that it allows you to actually, um, if you are doing a conventional 16S sequencing, that allows you to actually get full length 16S um, out down to a strain level resolution and you can recover uh, all these um, 16S variants using the tool called Data2. So I highly recommend you to take a read at the paper where they managed to resolve um, the copy number of different um, 16S strains. So shotgun sequencing with uh, HiFi reads allows you to actually get functional profiling without actually even assembling it because the reads are so accurate, you can actually um, get the genes directly from the reads itself. So um, meta genome assembly is, um, Kind of like what I will actually talk into more details in a bit, but um, in, in you know in 16s this is what you can see um, from a Nature Communication paper comparing to the conventional 16s sequencing with um, um, targeted region of V1, V2 um, to you know different regions combination of regions. If you you look at the um, full V1 to V9 region, which is easily allowed by PacBio HiFi sequencing, you can see that. Um, there is uh, very little um, species that is actually unresolved if you um, are able to sequence the entire region compared to the targeted regions of um, other V1 to V9 regions. So red color means that there are some clades that is actually unclassified, where a white color means that there is um, uh, the species are well um, classified. So with a shotgun sequencing, um, essentially a shotgun metagenomic sequencing, um, traditionally, 16S is used to quantify abundance, but when we look at um, abundance quantification using shotgun sequencing, we can also see a very um, well um, um, agreement between the expected composition and the shotgun sequencing data coming out of the sequence SQL2 system data. So with the MSA1003 um, mock community that you can actually download and take a look. We are actually able to successfully detect species down to 0.018% of um, abundance. And as I mentioned just now, with uh, HiFi sequencing, because the reads, um, when you do a shotgun metagenomic sequencing, you can see that the mean of the read length is about 1 KB, which is basically one um, gene for each, uh, uh, for, for the gene that is about 1 KB. So this means that for every single um, read, you can actually get about eight genes out of it. So, and, and the accuracy is um, more than 99% accurate. So this, you know, for um, gene profiling, you don't actually have to carry out assembly anymore because um, the reads are so accurate. Um, shown here is an example of a shotgun metagenomics assembly from a hi-fi read. And you can see that, um, you know, each of the graph here is actually a complete genome assembly and, um, a lot of them actually circular as well, um, straight out of the assembler. And you can actually get some of the plasmid assembly 
done as well. So um, in terms of uh, HiFi genome assembly for metagenomic um, sequencing, um, this is an example of a HiFi gut microbiome assembler. And really what you want to focus on is the number here, which um, on top of each bar, which is basically the number of um, context that is more than one in megabase. So a lot of these are actually complete genome assembly already. This means that um, each of this sample has been sequenced in one smart cell 8M. So with one smart cell 8M, you can actually get a lot of uh, complete genome assembly out of this sequencing already. And um, this allows you to actually get a complete draft genome or even um, circular genome for many of the unculturable uh, microbes. And um, I have actually put together a, a, you know, kind of like a bean completeness showing you that um, what you want to focus on is the dark color one, which is um, the context that is actually um, highly complete. So they are more than 90% complete based on the bacterial marker genes and they have very little contamination. So this is allowed because uh, this is actually possible because of the accuracy of HiFi reads. And you can see the number here is that for every um, sample, you are actually getting, you know, almost um, more than 20 complete genomes out of um, each um, um, smart cell 8M. And um, this is a, a different um, presentations of what is from the previous slide, basically showing you on the x-axis of the different GC percentage of the bacteria that has been assembled from the micro, micro uh, from the gut microbiome. And for each sample, you really, you can see that there's a wide range of uh, GC uh, percentage that, um, uh, you know, it, it, regardless of the GC percentage, you can actually get, get very complete genome assembly. And even at about 15-fold um, coverage, for some of the bacteria, you are actually getting a very complete genome. So yellow color means the genome is highly complete. Okay. Um, and um, these are really, uh, the label um, genomes here are actually more than 95% complete with less than 10 contacts and less than 5% contamination. So you're actually really getting many, many um, a lot of information out of your data. So, um, and um, you know, depending on your, um, um, applications. So this is um, some of the things that you can do with a one smart cell. Um, and if you want to multiplex, uh, that's possible as well. Um, you may not be able to get as uh, much um, as good of a performance as one smart cell for one sample in terms of assembly, but you can surely, you can still do very well in terms of um, detection and the assembly of some of the highly abundant species as well. So um, yeah, so this is um, the isosig method, which um, um, Dave and um, um, Dr. Chongxin has talked about just now as well, uh, allowing you to actually get a full length RNA sequencing um, of comparing to a conventional short rates technology, you can actually get a complete transcript out of uh, pack bio isosig solution. So um, I would not go into too much details about this because I want to actually um, uh, focus on what is actually possible now with a single cell isosig method. Um, so uh, single cell is kind of like the, um, you know, one of the hottest field in terms of RNA sequencing, but you can actually achieve single cell as well um, as isosig. You can put them together and, you know, get complete full length transcripts for each of the single cell. So, um, and this is really very easy because you can actually use any single cell platform to generate your full length DNA and just construct a smart bell library to, for um, pack bio sequencing. And the bioinformatics workflow is actually um, quite similar to how you will do it for, for um, short reads as well. And we provide actually a full bioinformatics workflow that you can um, find on a GitHub um, by um, uh, Liz, who is our staff scientist, um, to actually go through how to analyze this um, single cell. And finally, um, of course, you can actually carry out targeted sequencing as well with the SQL2 system to um, um, the most important usage is typically in terms of large amplicons, for example, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, um, uh, HLA sequencing, um, for you to actually um, uh, get a phase full length genes out of uh, every sequencing run. And you, know, you can actually discriminate between gene and pseudogene because of the high accuracy of HiFi reads. Um, also detecting minor variants with uh, amplicon sequencing. And you know, finally, as um, because uh, the sub data comes with methylation information as well, so that allows you to actually do um, some of this um, 
uh, applications. So uh, with that, I'll actually end my presentations. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, um, ask me. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Keepin. That was really, really, really useful. What we've got here, Tim Hewitt asks, um, given the accuracy of HIFO reads, is there still much benefit to using Illumina reads for polishing slash correction? Um, yeah, so, uh, hi, Tim, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, really on, uh, some of the latest workflow that we recommend, for example, for ISO SIG, um, we're actually recommending um, you know, not um, using Illumina reads for polishing as well as genome assembly. You know, as you can see just now from my presentations, a lot of the genome assembly are already up to Q50 um, after um, the uh, HiFi assembly itself. And there's really no um, strong benefits to polishing of Illumina reads as far as we can see from our customers' um, experience. And if you look at some of the recent talks, on um, you know high five genome assembly um, from the VGP for example, there's some experience from them in terms of whether polishing or not. It, it does give you a slight improvement, but it, you know it's really very minor, and you don't actually need it um, most of the time. Yeah, uh, I've got another one from CX. Uh, Keep in. Can you please elaborate a little more about uh, the use of high fi in sequencing the methylome? Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks uh, CX for the question. So um, right now, because of the, um, the way the, you know, the data output is um, being done, um, we haven't actually have a workflow in terms of uh, getting a methylum information in terms of hi-fi sequencing, um, but that is um, you know, an active development. So for now, if you actually want to um, uh, do a base modification analysis, um, you actually do get the information in a hi-fi sequencing library. However, you, you actually need to use the subreads itself for the kinetics information for, um, to actually get the methylation information. So um, we are hoping to come up with a workflow that you know, take advantage of the hi-fi reads itself um, by getting the met um, kinetic information for each of the single hi-fi reads. Um, but right now, that is still, uh, you know, a, a kind of like a work in progress. Yeah. I have just one, one just very general question. Um, PacBio has enabled HiFi reads on on most of its applications. Do you see a, a point where um, uh, HiFi reads is basically the default uh, mode for basically every application, or do you th still see a, a need to keep um, the, the older CLR mode um, running? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so, really, right now, you know, if you look at our application recommendation, um, what's left um, for, for CRR sequencing is really population detection of um, structural variant, for example. And that's really because um, um, of uh, economy reason as well as the um, turnaround time because with a CRR sequencing, you typically need to sequence uh, in, a, in a shorter time and, you know, and allowing you to actually get more data for the same time. So that's one of the use case. Um, whereas for microbial um, um, isolate sequencing, so that is, um, you know, we really only recommend CRR because we have a well-established pipeline already. Um, however, we do foresee that, you know, in the future as, um, HiFi gets um, cheaper and we, ha we do have a be better protocol for, for microbiome assembly that will actually eventually move on to HiFi as well. Um, so uh, ultimately, you know, I do see a future where almost everything can be done with HiFi, um, especially with, you know, the, um, currently what's on our rural map is really to increase, um, uh, further increase the throughput on SQL2 for HiFi reads. And, um, I think one day we'll see where, you know, it's just economical enough for you just do everything in hard five sequencing. Yeah. There might be some use for extremely long reads in terms of covering, uh, you know, those crazy long repeat region, but um, those are really actually very, very rare. And um, yeah, I, I, I believe high five sequencing has a much better advantage in terms of, um, you know, all the other applications. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much.
Okay. Um, what we might move on just quickly um, is to is to Anna's short talk on uh, UQ infrastructure. Um, just going to give us a demonstration, uh, a quick quick overview of the the types of things that UQ is capable of of, do, of doing. Oh, over to you, Anna. All right. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Anna. I work at uh, the University of Queensland in research infrastructure. Uh, today you heard a lot of information about sequencing and the latest uh, technologies and capabilities available uh, for genomics research. But I wanted to take a few minutes and introduce um, a few more capabilities that are available and that support researchers across the board uh, be it from um, human biomed, life sciences, plants and animal, earth and environmental studies, as well as physical sciences. So on this slide, you will see on the left-hand side uh, are uh, the 12 central, central research platforms, which I represent here today. And on the right-hand side, you will see the national research infrastructure facilities available at uh, UQ. So as you can see, there is so many capabilities here that are uh, able to complement genomics research, be it um, capabilities in imaging, characterization, nanotechnology, um, services in the computed proteins, uh, bioprocess development uh, capabilities in, in high performance computing and data repositories. So you can see how uh, wide and varied uh, this network is and we are really here to support all researchers in their um, study journey regardless if it's in the discovery and research space or more on the translation and impact space. Um, you, saw, you saw earlier today, we also sometimes have access to funding and grants. And also important to highlight is that all these facilities are open access or heavily subsidized. So if ever you need any further uh, information or support to your research, please reach out. I've, sh I've shared here the mission of research infrastructure team. But all this really means is, is, is if you're a researcher, we definitely uh, have the resources to uh, support you. So uh, we could, even, you know, with all these existing infrastructure and capabilities that are managed and supported by leading experts and that really indeed know the latest trends and technologies. And we can save you a little bit of time and money, I guess, in your research. If you are an industry partner, uh, likewise, uh, if you have a problem or an issue or something that you just maybe want to um, brainstorm and throw around, please also let us know because there are many uh, collaboration opportunities that all these uh, platforms can support you on. I've put here in the slide presentation uh, our strategic goal, uh, and really this is um, in uh, UQ's research space, we definitely live and breathe all these, um, uh, all these five teams. Uh, so this is not something that's new. This, is, uh, this has been around for a while. And I've noticed that many organizations operating in uh, research, uh, a lot of your organizations too, probably have similarly aligned goals. So every decision, uh, every uh, new instrument that we acquire, every new process, uh, all of that di directly, it's very intentional and purposeful. It definitely leads into any, all of these uh, impact teams. So uh, we, are, we are here to help you guys make a difference and make an impact. To that extent, I've put here some information that could be available, uh, applicable to, to people uh, here today. So if you need um, any support in any of these capabilities, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, thank you also to um, AGRF and uh, IMB sequencing team for including me in this presentation. 
uh, I spent many years uh, in uh, business and commercial space and people there always talk about network, network, how important is your network or you're only as good as your network. And I guess that's also very applicable to research space. Uh, use our network, uh, please use our uh, resources already there, all these amazing, amazing capabilities. And um, yes, if you need anything, please, please contact me. All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, okay, uh, now we're just gonna generally open up uh, the floor to, to questions for anyone on our panel. Um, uh, if there's any questions coming in, um, uh, you can ask them for a question for anyone, uh, for anyone who was, uh, spoke today. Um, I, I might just start with a question to sort of kick, kick this off a little bit. Um, I, th I think some of my questions are uh, very specific areas, just sort of areas I'm kind of interested in a little bit more information on. Um, question for keep in, um, with, um, uh, the, the no ant. Um, application. That, that, that's an application that uh, I find particularly interesting. Um, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about that, like in terms of um, how well can that application be used for, for, for say, targeted methylation? Um, I, I've often thought that, that a targeted methylation application would be uh, really useful. Is that something that you're exploring or has been done much? Um, yeah. Um... Yeah, well, you know, targeted methylation, um, um, I mean, really, honestly, you know, because NOAM is so new that we haven't actually seen um, um, kind of like a, a lot of applications in terms of um, doing that. Um, yeah. But, well, I mean, you know, I, I really can't uh, give you kind of like an experience in terms of, you know, whether we have any um, experience in this. But um, theoretically speaking, I, you know, I don't, think there is any um you know issue in terms of getting that because the kinetic information is there and there is no um amplification protocol involved so yeah i mean you know i i'm as i look forward to seeing applications into uh doing that yeah yeah no it, it really looks like a very interesting approach uh it's sort of a way to target but because you're not amplifying you're not losing those methylation signals um very interesting uh, uh, in my talk, I, I briefly touched on uh, COVID-19 because it's, it's topical at the moment. Uh, is there any plans from uh, PacBio to develop a, a panel for um, sequencing COVID-19? I know, I know that there are um, AMPCON sets that, that people are using at the moment, but do you think PacBio might actually bring out a, a panel for that? Um. Right now, um, we don't actually have a plan to, you know, have a kind of like a panel for um, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing itself. Um, I think that's really because, um, you know, there's really for us is um, the community has been, you know, providing a lot of very exciting um, primers design um, that that actually works pretty well already. So, um, you know, there's really no strong reasons that for us to actually reinvent the wheel in terms of um, providing a panel itself. Um, but, you know, and, and I think one of the um, main thing here to note as well is that depending on your clinical samples quality, you know, sometimes when the amplicon gets too long, it, you know, it doesn't work very well for samples with low quality. So, um, but we actually just seen customers um, running SARS-CoV-2 sequencing in um, actually seven to eight kilobase amplicons. So that will cover your entire genome in just about three to four amplicons. So those are really exciting applications. Um, and I think that really the next um, step for, you know, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing itself is really um, on the immune part where we um, have um, some of the customers that's trying to sequence the immune profile um, through BCR sequencing, TCR sequencing, and to really look at what is um, in, in um, the immune um, characteristics of patients who recover or, or you know, get infected, you know, um, associating kind of the immune profile to how they respond to um, the, the virus itself. So those are really what we think is 
um, the next exciting things that you can do with pack biosequencing, um, you know, just kind of like getting the immune repertoire of um, patients um, rather than sequencing the virus genome itself because that is actually quite um, easily done regardless of the technologies that you want to use. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, if you, if you do have any question, you can please forward it on to us. Um, uh, uh, I want to thank all of our speakers today. Um, they've been really excellent. Um, and um, I appreciate everyone's time to, to, to come to our PacBio webinar and, and um, listen to these talks. Uh, I just remind people again about the, the Smart Grant program. Uh, I can just quickly put that back up on the screen again. Uh, it, it is open now, I believe. Um, you can uh, submit your application. Um, just talk about um, how you think how HiFi Reads could accelerate your science. Um, and yeah, you could be um, getting uh, your research uh, um, covered by PacBio and Adrian and UQ. Um, thank you all. Thank you very much for, for coming to the talk. Appreciate it.